This session uh, will be recorded. Uh, my name is Tim, and I'm from the library. And uh, I was thinking how time flies because this is a fourth uh, talk in uh, our series of biodiversity uh, seminar organized by the library. Um, after this session, there'll be another session uh, on the 20, let me see. 28th of October by uh, Dr. Wan Juso, who is now with uh, Monash University in Malaysia. Um, I don't know what the topic is yet. Fire, fire, She was just really quickly for everybody. So Wan, who used to work at the museum uh, with, with um, where Darren is, uh, Wan was part of a team of firefly Scientists who discovered uh, a recent firefly species from Singapore. I was quite cool. Yeah. cool. So. Okay. Uh, our moderator for today is Dr. Anthony Medrano, who is the uh, NUS uh, Presidential Young Professor of Environmental Studies. Uh, I shall now hand over to him. Thank you. Great. Thanks. 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 Paper, yes. I need the paper to properly introduce. Uh, okay. Thank you all. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, so, uh, like Tim said, my name is Anthony. I'm from Yale and U.S. College, and I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, um, Professor Darren um, uh, Darren Yeo. Um, Darren is head of the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum. He's uh, an associate professor at the Department of Biological Sciences at NUS. Um, he runs the Freshwater and Invasion Biology Laboratory at NUS, and he's co-PI on a, um, a project that we're both part of, uh, which looks at um, biodiversity history in Singapore and Southeast Asia and combines that with the digital humanities. Um, Darren's research focuses on freshwater ecology, uh, biodiversity aquatic invasions, freshwater crustaceans, um, and this is largely what his lab investigates. Um, today's talk is entitled Changing Landscapes and Biodiversity in Singapore's Freshwaters. And I'm excited to be part of this because I have, I have a real uh, interest in freshwaters here in Singapore. And um, uh, join me in welcoming um, Darren. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, all right, I guess I'll just get started. With this. All right, so um, uh, this this um this um talk is really um a combination, uh, uh, really a summary of, of the uh, the work of um, uh, that my lab has been doing over the, the last several years, plus some of my colleagues as well. But it's also a, a chance for me to uh, introduce. Um, essentially, Singapore's freshwater habitats and freshwater biodiversity, right? Okay, so, oh, I know this is Zoom thing. Yeah. Okay, now you can. Yeah. I get that one. Okay. Um, all right, before that, uh, Acknowledgements first because I will forget later. So first, thanks NUS Library for, for having me uh, and inviting me to give this talk. Um, most of the things, as I said, most of it is uh, work from my lab, but definitely in partnership with the Comcha Natural History Museum, various other um, various other colleagues, colleagues in uh, biological sciences, and several of the government agencies that have uh, given permission and supported uh, work in various ways. And a lot of the photos uh, and inputs, in fact, for some of the things that I'm talking about today um, are featured in a couple of these books, but also a lot of these are the work of various people who are named here. So um, uh, my thanks to all of them for generously sharing their photos and inputs. Uh, and definitely a lot of the work is from my lab. So if there's anything that, uh, that I'm presenting here today that is uh, interesting, and good and all that is all because of them. If there's anything is wrong, it's probably my fault. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to appropriate so our work. Okay. Um, all right, so um, changing landscapes. What is this? So I'm not used to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
changing landscapes, changing biodiversity causes optimism, and then just dealing with climate change. So let's go down the line. So this is a little in quick introduction into uh, some of Singapore's fresh waters and some scenes from the past and, and present. So maybe this might be familiar to some of the folks here who grew up in the 70s or were around in the 70s. Um, uh, we had some problems with some of our reservoirs. Uh, they were covered with um, these microphytes, these uh, aquatic plants, mm. salvinia and the, um, um, the water hyacinth. And they, they, these plants were around no, even before the 70s, but for whatever reason, um, uh, they started to bloom in the 70s in one or two reservoirs. And it caused nightmares really for some of the government agencies, the water agency people who were dealing with these things. Um, you couldn't really use uh, chemicals and all that to, to deal with it. And uh, because these are, you know, drinking water reservoirs, they want to play safe and, and all that. So you really have to mechanically remove them, right? But this has caused nightmares for, for a lot of them. And now the, the, the problems have been uh, alleviated because one of the reasons they found, of course, was that uh, the watershed around those reservoirs right, had a lot of farms and all that. So there's a lot of agricultural uh, runoff and input and all that. So you know, eventually it, it settled down. And you can still see pockets of some of these floating plants in certain arms of the reservoirs. And all that. Another scene from the past in Singapore is this. If you, uh, in the 70s, when you go past the reservoirs, right, for me, uh, well, it's my, it's my uh, semi-annual trip to the zoo, and of course my parents to drag me to the zoo and all this. Then uh, you see these little things floating on the reservoirs. These are actually floating cages, right? They are aquacultural cages, right? They are used to uh, house um, big head carp, all right? So big head carp was used was one of the um, was one of the the approaches that the water agency was using to try to alleviate the algal blooms. Now, besides the 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 plants that were blooming, they also had algal blooms. Uh, so the egg is known to be a filter feeder, right? But instead of releasing them, just ad hoc release them into reservoirs, they kept them in floating cages. Basically use them like, you know, stationary vacuum cleaner, right? So to try to feed and, you know, and in fact, it was very successful because uh, what happens was um, the carp were breeding so well that they managed to sell the carp and use some of that money to actually expand their biology unit, hire people, you know, like small biology unit. The water agency is dominated by engineers. Right. So, but now you don't see this anymore because the 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 situation is a bit better. But this was an this was one of the first instances of a uh, uh, kind of bio manipulation, and uh, and together with you know trying to deal with the watershed and all that, this was a, an integrated approach to trying to deal with some of these environmental issues with the water quality. Right. Uh, yeah. Sorry. And this is the big head cut. Uh, they don't breed here locally. Um, but they can grow, right? Um, so another scene from the past is this. If you go past Singapore River, Kalang River and all that in the 70s, 60s and all that, you see a lot of these, what we call uh, tongkangs or lighters or these little bump boats, uh, simple way of saying it's bump boats. These were the boats that were used to ferry things in and out from the, uh, from the, the vessels that couldn't come in and, and all that, uh, right? Um, but there was also a lot of pollution uh, and all that in those days. So, and they could go uh, could have access to the commercial ships, right? Because this was an estuary. It wasn't a it was Singapore River, Kalang River estuary, right? It's not fresh water at all. Um, but this of course led to a lot of pollution and, and all that. And there's there's a lot of legacy uh, involved there. Uh, but now if you go past the area, you don't see any of these things. And in fact, the place is more. Um, about as fresh as you can get uh, fresh water because they have dammed up the basin and now you have arena reservoir there. Another scene from the past is floods. We used to get a lot of floods in Singapore, right? especially when it coincides with spring tide and, and all this. Um, so it's quite a, a regular um, uh, feature. Um, and floods are, are just a normal, normal, um, uh, Normal event like in the life of, of freshwater habitat, right? Uh, of course, when it's when it's associated with us living there and inconveniencing us, it becomes a, a, a major problem, uh, infrastructure-wise and, and and things like that. Um, and it also led to probably the escape of a few non-native species into our waters. But 
what can you do, right? Um, yeah, but it's not a major problem, although occasionally it still happens, right? Even up to not too long ago. Um, and finally, another one more scene from the past is this. I mean, in the old days, there were more of these kind of rural streams. People would go out and you know, kids would play in water and all that. Kids would go inside these, these uh, canals and streams to try and catch fishes, usually non-native guppies yeah. and things like that. Um, uh, which is less common now. Uh, certainly when people go into the canals and all that, it gets a little bit worried. Uh, you worry because the canals are basically built for flesh flooding. That's what that's their aim, their purpose, right? So uh, it can be a bit dangerous, but uh, I guess you don't see so much of this now. Okay, so anyway, uh, now I just want to give you a very quick uh, uh, introduction to freshwater habitats in Singapore. This is dedicated to that one student who um, first joined my lab many years ago um, and really asked me this question. And I've got various variations of this question over the years from various people. Um, so yes, yeah, Singapore does have freshwater habitats, right? Even though it may not be immediately obvious when you look, look at it, we're highly urbanized. Most of it is great built up area, right? So where, where is all the fresh water? Fresh water is everywhere, okay? So two thirds of Singapore's work of island, Right, is water catchment. But a lot of it is urban. Right? So I guess when people say we don't have freshwater habitats, it's because they're not really thinking in terms of the urban freshwater habitats. They're thinking mainly you know, nice pastoral forest streams and you know, uh, this kind of thing, meadows with water running through it, <laughs> right? Um, but for us, right, even the, the drains and, and all this kind of thing, that these are actually quite important, right? They are, they are, they are major. Um, uh, component of our freshwater landscape, right? So our freshwater habitats comprise things like reservoirs, uh, ponds, urban ponds, streams, canals, mm -hmm. and what I, what I term rural streams, which are essentially, you know, like streams where they're, they're, instead of being dominated by trees, it's mainly grass and all that. It's like, so they are sort of uh, at the edges of the forest and things like that. They are, um, they are usually uh, situated in unprotected catchments. So catchment, unprotected catchment means essentially they, um, uh, there's, there's development allowed within the catchment, right? So you can have building, uh, light industry and things like that. Okay, so there's a higher chance of pollution uh, entering these, uh, these uh, water, freshwater habitats. The, they tend to be a bit warmer because they're quite open, exposed, no ash tree cover. The, the pH has to be neutral to alkaline. These two points are, there's a many more physical chemical parameters, but these two are particularly useful when you think about the kind of species that you have living inside these areas. And so the kind of species living inside these areas, they can take unprotected catchments. I mean, as in they can handle their pollution, right? They're a bit tolerant. They can also handle warmer, uh, neutral to alkaline type waters. In fact, they may not only be able to tolerate, they may prefer it, right? Okay, then. Yeah, so most of the things actually in Singapore, among our freshwater biota, right, most of the organisms that can take these kind of conditions tend to be non-native species. Do we have natural freshwater habitats? Yes, we do. So we still have some freshwater natural habitats, um, and these are mainly in central part of uh, Singapore, um, in the central catchment nature reserve, and of course, uh, we dotted in a few other places here and there, but most of them are there in the center. They include freshwater swamp, forest streams, and again, some rural streams, similarly uh, to the earlier part, because again, they are, these rural streams basically are like the interface, uh, right? Transitions zone between the natural and the urban habitats, because some of these forest streams will be nice and foresty, and then they just flow a little bit further out and go out and become a dream. Once you go out in the nature reserve, because they're all connected, right? So connectivity is an important point. Uh, there are fewer of them. Uh, the catchment area is protected because it's inside the nature reserve. And in fact, that was how it was gazetted in the 19th century. They gazetted this area as a... Um, and the, no, I shouldn't be talking about this kind of thing when they're historians here, but I think Korea, something like that. <laughs> so anyway, um, and the, it, the, the area is gazetted as a uh, central catchment nature reserve. So the word catchment has always been in the name of that nature reserve. Okay, So it's, it's really to protect the catchment. Um, and... Uh, because it's mostly forested, 
right? There's there's no there's no development allowed inside. Occasionally they build a small trail, car park, whatever, but no major development, right? Um, uh, it tends to be more forested because it's more forested. The waters are cooler, shaded, uh, and they are more acidic, right? So lower pH for for folks who may not be familiar, lower pH, more acidic doesn't necessarily mean you put your finger in, your finger dissolve, right? So it's just a bit more acidic, right? But not too acidic, okay? It's acidic because, you know, from the, from the trees, the leaves all drop, then they stay in the water for a while, they release tannins, you know, like tea, okay? Um, and then, so most of the species that can handle this are our native species, so it's a whole different assemblage, right? So, um, now that you have that context, Let's talk a little bit about the changing biodiversity, the new places and new faces that have been coming around. Um, so for this part, I just want to talk about post 1960s. So there's been changing habitats and changing fish diversity since the 1960s, um, probably longer. But this is the con uh, this is based on one particular study, so I just focus on this. Huh? Um, just to add a little bit more context, Singapore's original freshwater habitats are more like our natural forests. Uh, natural forest streams and, and freshwater as well. Okay, mostly small, uh, flowing, uh, slow flowing, acid water forest streams. We never had large lakes or rivers. Uh, so, consequently, we never had large river species, never have large river fish and all that, and lake species. Okay, so that's the background. And so, typically, this is what Singapore looked like in the 60s. Only at, in the 60s, I think we only had three, at that time only three reservoirs. The rest were all not dammed up yet. So most of them were small little rivers. Uh, but you know, in the 60s and 70s onwards, we had, there was extensive damming of uh, river mouse because Singapore is a I know you know when, when the Sumatra squalls are coming, it doesn't feel like it, but Singapore is technically a water scarce country, right? So we are a water scarce country, uh, we have water, but we don't have major um uh, like um, a water watersheds that can hold hold uh, or major aquifers, right? So we are technically water uh, water scarce. So they try to build more reservoirs, right, to 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 retain that water as part of one of the several approaches to to uh, addressing that water scarcity. In doing so, right, they dam this up. We lose some of these habitats. So they dam up, but not only do they do damming or or impounding of the river drainages, they also canalize. Right, the canalization. There's two reasons for doing that. Okay, one is to of um, uh, one is to alleviate flooding. Right, as I said, these canals and all that they are they're meant to move large volumes of water away from wherever you don't want them to be to somewhere else, uh, in as quickly as possible. Uh, alleviate the floods. Right, but the other thing was this: Singapore also was in the heart of the malaria zone. Right. So one of the main things that people were trying to do was to try to, uh, whenever you see any stagnant water, either you spray with oil or you move the water. Move the water means you channelize it or canalize it so the water will flow, flow faster, less stagnant water, less hospital, less disease, who did you, right? Okay. So based on that, uh, what we did was, there was this paper in 1966 that, that uh, actually recorded the fish data, uh, the fish fauna in Singapore. Right. So we wanted to look at uh, changes in the fish assemblages following all this canalization and impoundment over 40 years. Because in 2010, we managed to do some studies. And um, so what we found in a nutshell is that there was loss of native species in both canals as well as reservoirs. Because by 2010, not all of them had been dammed up. So by 2010, you still have some canals, right? They're not dammed up, but their canals are they're not streams. They're, they're not um, they're not uh, non-concretized streams and all that. Okay, so by 2010, we have lost native species both in the reservoirs as well as the canals. We also found that there was a replacement of native bottom feeding fishes by non-native species in the reservoirs. And we also found that the food webs or the food chains, right, were shorter in the canals and longer in the reservoirs. I guess that makes a bit more sense when you think about how reservoirs will have a bit more energy and more food. Mm -hmm. Uh, and more nutrients. Okay. Uh, so this, these are just some of the species that we were uh, encountering in this study. Right? This is an example of some of the native stream species that were present in the canals 
uh, in all these drainages in 1966, but by the time we studied them again in 2010, they were no longer in the reservoirs, nor were they, were they in the canals. You can still encounter them now if you go into the nature reserve, into some of our forest streams and our freshwater swamp. Okay, so these are just some examples of uh, native species. So typically, uh, our native fish species are really small, small forest dwelling species, acid water specialists, very colorful, but very small. Okay, um, don't deal well with big, uh, fast flowing waters or big open waters and all that. But what we do have now is we have a lot of non native riverine species. Now, these are supposed to be river riverine specialists. These are fishes that you generally find in large rivers, right? So they were not in Singapore before the damming, right? Based on the, the old paper, but we found them uh, by 2010, they were already in our reservoirs, right? Our reservoirs are not large rivers, but they are large lakes. I mean, they're artificial lakes, which basically mimics some aspects of these large rivers. So we have things like the South American stingray, uh, and, uh, this is South, Southeast Asian uh, knife fish, South American, Southeast Asian. So we have some species here, they are non-native, we consider them non-native, but they are actually Southeast Asian native species. They are found in Malaysia, found in Sumatra, found in Johor, nearby, right? But we consider them to be introduced here because we never had the habitat for them to begin with, because these are big species. Yeah? Then we also have non-native lake species, absent but now present. And we have some uh, generalists that uh, you know generally found in both, both types of habitats but now you find in our reservoirs. So this is just uh, an example, uh, right? So post 1960s, now if later on, right, in the 80s, we start to get even newer, uh, uh, another group of newcomers, okay? So non-native species that you might not have seen maybe 20 to 30 years ago, instead of 40, 50 years ago, maybe 20 to 30 years ago, you might not have seen some of these. And most of, the, most of them were brought in through these few pathways, right? ornamental trade, aquarium trade, uh, live food trade. And then once they are in Singapore, right, they need to be released into the wild, right? They can be brought into the trade, but if they stay in the trade, then good luck, everybody is a good pet owner and nobody releases anything, right? Okay, so then, but then otherwise, uh, once you get in the pathway, you get into the country, then they will be introduced into the wild for various reasons, you know, uh, abandoned pet, religious release, biological control, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the species that have become much more predominant since the 1980s. This whole family called the cichlids, this group uh, uh, includes your tilapia, angelfish, oscar, some of these very familiar things, right? That people are familiar with. Um, they are very successful in Singapore. In fact, generally, globally, they're actually quite one of the, one of the more successful groups, uh, right? But they are not native to Southeast Asia. The nearest native ones are in, uh, in India, okay, South Asia. But generally, they are found in India, South America, Africa. So they are very successful group. Uh, they are highly adaptable, very wide tolerance. These are all the characteristics you get of successful introduced species, right? Uh, they have egg care, they have brood care. You know, you take care of your anak, then you know they can survive better and things like that, right? You introduce, they, they include some of these popular and successful ornamental agricultural species. If they are popular in the trade, means there's an even higher chance that people will be bringing them in. More people will be taking, um, buying them, and more people will be getting tired of them and releasing them, and things like that, right? Um, so we found up to 32 cyclic species so far in Singapore. Um, interestingly, even the within non-native species that are brought in, right? There can be stories of turnover. So the Mozambique tilapia, right? The lower one is the Mozambique tilapia, right? Um, this was a cichlid that was introduced during the Second World War, during the Japanese occupation for, for food. And then it's been established in Singapore for a long time. Established means they're here, uh, they're breeding here, you know, like in certain habitats, okay? But in the 80s, this interesting species was brought into Singapore possibly through food trade and things and, and all that. And this is also a cichlid, but this species, the green chromite, is actually from, um, uh, it's actually from uh, India, okay? India and Sri Lanka. And um, so it has basically 
taken over from the Mozambique tilapia in many of Singapore's habitats, where as a kid, I used to see the tilapia everywhere. Right now, I see uh, in the estuaries and in some of the coastal reservoirs, I don't see tilapia, I see this. Occasionally, I still see this tilapia. But this tilapia is still hold up in certain places, like the, the canals you have. The canals are really tough habitats. Very few things do well there. The canals are where these guys are still doing well. There are very few other things there, besides pythons and cats and dogs. Okay, whatever. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, give props to. So in several of the slides, there are some of our collaborators and some of our uh, some of my, my labs uh, students and, and colleagues and, and all that. So this is Dr. Tan Yaqui from the Lecom Chen Natural History Museum. And some of this work is based on uh, things that he's done in the past. Um, so, and this pattern looks to be repeating itself. For example, the toman, the giant snakehead, has been in Singapore for a number of years, actually. Introduced, done well in the reservoirs. I think, I believe it was introduced to do as a form of biological control in our reservoirs, right? But then, um, the peacock bass was introduced a bit later in the 80s, and seems to be having an effect. This is, this, I got no, sorry, I got no quantitative data, okay, it seems uh, so it's anecdotal, you take a word for it. Um, seems to be uh, having an, an effect on the, the giant snakehead. It's not as big as the snakehead. It's not as fierce as the snakehead. But they are both top predators where we find them in the food webs. Um, but they also have possibly what we, what we call intragill predation, which means maybe uh, this guy, instead of going after the, the adults, right, is, going to, is feeding on the young. Right, because they will protect the young, but then these guys will be on the edges trying to probably um, prey on the young. Mm -hmm. um, another of the recent newcomers is this African species of catfish. Um, the African shuttle catfish has replaced our local native species, the common walking catfish, in Singapore's urban freshwaters in many, many places. So um, let me see, pre-1995, pre you can see that they were pre-1995, so pre-1995 uh, mostly was our native uh, walking catfish. Um, so it, and our native walking catfish goes to about uh, common walking catfish maybe goes to about 30 cm, 40 cm at most. The African one can go to about one point something meters, <laughs> but they are same genus, right? So anyway, post-95, I think around uh, early 2010s, we were uh, doing some studies and we found that wherever this had been reported from, we uh, had, in most cases, it was replaced by this. Okay, so there's this circumstantial evidence that there's some replacement going on, okay, or displacement. Uh, ironically, this species is listed as one of the world's 100 worst invasive species. So this I'll give to the world. Okay, <laughs> now world's having revenge on us. Okay. Um, the golden apple snail, another one of those famous uh, invasive species. We have a local version of the apple snail. Which, we, uh, which is a Southeast Asian native species. Similar pattern, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but same thing happened where it once used to be in the urban freshwaters, it's now been replaced largely by the South American species. Okay, and um, so previously, uh, that was work done by uh, BUA, one of our former PhD students, and Tingui now uh, lecturer in Sabah. So this was her work, and she was a PhD student. Um, Another bit of work done by another PhD student, um, Ewan, uh, he looked at the red claw crayfish. Now, Singapore doesn't have crayfish, but naturally, uh, man, I know you go to aquarium shop a lot of crayfish, but Singapore naturally doesn't have crayfish. Uh. What we have here, our equivalent are freshwater crabs. Okay, So what happens is globally, uh, generally, tropical areas, the tropical bank, you tend to have freshwater crabs. The further up, further down you go, higher latitudes, they tend to be replaced by crayfish. Uh. They don't look exactly the same, but functionally they are quite equivalent within the system. Okay, so very few uh, crayfish do well in the tropics. Most crayfish are temperate species, except for a few. Now this species is from northern Australia and New Guinea. So of course, same same latitude, uh, right? More or less, uh, it's tropical. That's well here actually. So this is called a red claw crayfish. Um, we've seen it in many reservoirs. And it's starting to penetrate some of the streams, actually. Okay, so this is one of the species that can actually do the non-native species that can go into the streams and do well. Uh, and did some experiments and found that potentially can outcompete our native freshwater crabs. 
Um, other recent newcomers, American bullfrog, winter frog. Uh, American bullfrog came in the 1980s. We've had non-native frogs here since the 19th century. Uh. Okay, there's one, one species that's been here since the uh, 1800s, uh, probably came in from China. But the uh, American bullfrog came in the 1980s. Um, interestingly, it, it, so it's, it's quite prevalent. You can see when you go to some of these uh, reservoir areas, especially just after somebody has released a bag full of them. Okay, which happens, uh, right? But the thing is, um, so far they are not established. That means they are not breeding here. They may survive. They can eat a little bit and all that, but they don't. They don't uh, lay eggs in a while. They, their tadpoles are not there. The tadpoles, if they are there, you, there's no way you miss them. Okay, maybe. Um, so they are there, but the thing is, even if they are not breeding, right? If you release enough of them, and they're always there, they're there, <laughs> right? So if they are going to have an impact, they might still have an impact. Okay. But so far, we had some preliminary studies that suggest that maybe they're not so happy to be released uh, because the ones in the wild are a bit emaciated. Right? The ones that are in captivity are a bit happier, which is good uh, because after a while, they go to the pot for food. That's why they're here. Um, this species, winter frog, was introduced in more recently. I think in the 1990s, people started hearing the call. Uh, around 2000s, then, people, then we, there was the first re re report of um, Observation of them. Their call is very unmistakable. It sounds like a baby crocodile. I'm not going to imitate it here for this. <laughs> nice try. Um, but it's, it's, the, it's like barking, a little barking kind of. It's one of the few frogs that barks during the day. Correct? Yes. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Capitological society. <laughs> no, come right. Uh, okay. So, uh, look, so those are the sound of the newcomers. So you have all these newcomers, all these little stories and all that here and there, right? What we were interested in, in knowing was how do they, you know, how do we interact with one another? Fine, you know what's there, great. Are they eating each other? Are they fighting each other? What exactly is happening? So um, one easy way, it's not that easy to do, but one way of, of finding out what, uh, or manifesting how they're interacting with each other is to, try to understand their food web, to assemble or characterize their food web. So we did uh, studies over the last uh, uh, for 20, wow, 10 years, 10 over years, over several reservoirs uh, using various methods, uh, which I won't detail here. But basically, we managed to characterize the food web of most of these reservoirs. You can actually do it without having to go out and do the field work. You can know what is there. You can look at the literature, understand your biology, and then you can conceptually say, well, I think this and this and this and this and this. And then you have this conceptual food web. But what we tried to do was we tried to use actual data, right? We, we, we collect them, we have to dissect them, look at their gut contents, we take tissue, and we you know, try to find out um, something called the isotopic ratio and, and to, to, to try to understand where they sit in this system relative to one another. Okay, so then that's where you get full web. Lah. Okay, what was interesting, we found, to me it was interesting, lah, because these are novel systems, no? the reservoir is like, you know, it's really a novel system here. Uh, and this is a bunch of animals that never met each other before. And so now they're all together. Um, what's going to happen? Interestingly, if you look at some of the parameters of the full web, they are actually comparable to, comparable to na natural lakes. Right, so there is some, there is some mechanistic, there's some formula, right? That that basically, I don't care what species, if you have a bunch of things, assembly, uh, assembled and put together, right? They follow certain rules, you end up with a certain kind of complexity, right? That that uh sort of reflects nature. We we found this out by comparing it with natural lakes, huh? okay? But of course, some parameters we still are very different because most of the natural lakes. In this part of the world are much much bigger than our reservoirs. Okay, so certain things like the number of species is smaller than that for us. Anyway, what we found in the end, we have 12 to 18 fishes per, per reservoir. Um, uh, and we across 12 reservoirs, we have about 45 species uh, all told. And as I mentioned earlier, most of them reservoirs are non-native, uh, unnatural or artificial habitats or urban habitats is dominated by non-native species, okay? So mostly all these are uh, uh, Afrotropical, Neotropical, 
All right. So if you could actually dive in a reservoir and snorkel or you can't see anything, but if you can, right? It's very interesting. It really looks like some um uh, exotic fish tank. Uh, okay. Uh, mostly cichlids. Um so what, what do these changes mean exactly? What, what does all this mean? What this means actually is that there is a freshwater biodiversity squeeze, at least for our native species. Our native species all squeeze into small little areas. Firstly, the central catchment nature reserve, right? But even within the central catchment nature reserve, there are even more squeezed into one particular corner called the Nisun Swamp Forest, which is the last freshwater swamp forest we have, right? That freshwater swamp forest is very, very important for us. Most of our native species are restricted, as I said, here and then particularly to here. That freshwater swamp forest contains almost 50% of our freshwater fishes and 50% of our decapod crustaceans. I mean, I focus on these two partly because that's the data we have, partly because I'm biased, because I work on crustaceans. Um, and this also includes local endemics, things that are only found in central catchment, only found in Nisu and nowhere else plus a few global endemics found in Singapore and nowhere else. And when I use the word endemic here, I mean in, the term, in terms of biodiversity endemic found here and nowhere else, not COVID endemic, right? <laughs> COVID endemic means our case here to stay. Uh, okay, so, um, so it, it also means that we have lost a lot of things, right? We have lost a lot of it, mainly because our natural habitats have gone, uh, right? More than 90% of it is gone. 95% loss of forest habitat and the associated streams, right? So most of it is gone and affected some groups, especially the freshwater crustacean and the freshwater fishes. And the rest of the, the remaining 5% that we of our original forest habitat that has streams and all that is still under threat. Maybe not so much under threat from forest loss, right? Because now we've already lost most of it and we're just trying to protect and keep make good, uh, keep good what we have, right? But the remaining one still is under threat uh, from other, other, other factors, like invasive species, for example, right? So is that cause for optimism? Um, because all this sounds like quite depressing, right? But I think there's some cause for optimism based on what we've seen. Uh. Uh, one of the things we have seen is that resistance is not necessarily futile. While the reservoirs, all these urban habitats are all connected ultimately to our forest streams at some, some way or other, we found a kind of a, a resistance, a barrier, right? There aren't that many uh, native species um, coming out, but there are definitely not that many non-native species coming in. There may be a few. So that at least helps us to prioritize that we, we zoom in and try to focus on the ones that might go in, right? This could be environmental, right? Could be because different pH, you know, different, the habitat is different, but it could also be the resistance of the community itself, right? And the resistance of the community itself, this, this is almost a chicken egg, right? The resistance of the community itself, biology, biologically, right, could be also um, maintained by the fact that the forest habitat remains intact as well, right? Um, other things to be optimistic about, as I said, we have things like endemics. So that is actually a very very, um, I guess, very cool thing that we have things that I found here and nowhere else. Again, I, I, I'm biased, so I focus on crabs. So we have three species of freshwater crab that I found here and nowhere else in the world. So something worth protecting, right? We also have things that maybe they're not endemic to Singapore. They're found in Singapore plus a few other places. But we have some kind of natural heritage connection with them because these species, and there are several more, many more in fact, these were species that were described from Singapore. The first time the new name was ever given, right? The specimens were discovered in Singapore, or at least some of the specimens were from Singapore, right? I mean, we have things that are really old, like this from the 19, early 1900s, right? Right down to 1995, 95, 91, okay? So right up to the 90s, we were still discovering new species, uh, new to science, okay? Which was, again, um, quite... Uh, Quite remarkable, right? Um, and then there are a few more unexpected discoveries. Okay, recently, uh, my colleagues from uh, the Hong Kong Natural History Museum, they, they described this new species, uh, Barbodis salifer. Um, so I thought fishes, are, you know, fish are quite big, quite obvious. 
It's hard to find a new species, right? Um, but they describe it as a new one. But this actually, what actually happens if you read the papers, is actually a case of mistaken identity, right? So they found that what we used to call, what we used to call, um, what we used to call, sorry, um, Banksy. No, first we call it biodatas, wrong spelling. Biodatas. Then later we call it Banksy. Then later, after they did a taxonomic revision, they found that okay, what we have in Singapore is none of these things. Is it anything else? Is there a name? Can we give it a name? No name. Ah, yeah. Then must call a new species already. Yeah. So we give it a new. So they give it a new name. All right. It's not that that this thing was not here and nobody saw it. It's always been here. It's just called by a different name. Okay. So this is one example. Um, this is what uh, that uh, Lydia Gunn was involved in for her masters. Um, so this was another surprise. This species, right, when it was uh, first discovered, this is species called Microbrachium filimanus. And earlier on, I showed you this species. Uh, when I described this years ago, we at first thought that it was this. Then, we, then after doing all my analysis and all that, blah, 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 found out, oh, actually it's new, it's different. Okay, we don't have this here, okay, fine. Then recently, we were looking in a place that we had never looked before. It seems also small, how can you look in a place you never looked before, but there still are places. So we found a place you never looked before, and then we found this here. So, you know, quickly went to tell our colleagues who work on prawns here, who did their PhD here, and I said, hey, how come you missed it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so anyway, we're working. This is now uh, actually something of significance to NPARKS. National Parks Board is uh, actually has listed this as under their species recovery program. Okay, they, they list a few species. And what they do in that is they try in various ways to uh, enhance the natural populations, maybe do some translocation, ex situ breeding, whatever they can do. Um, so these are some of the things that are happening. So what we have to do now is deal with the change, right? There's a lot of change in the habitats. We just have to keep calm, conserve, right? There are various approaches we've done in Singapore. Uh, we continue with fundamental and applied bio biodiversity and ecological research, leading to publications, leading to popular publications as well as technical publications uh, with not necessarily high impact factor, but very significant and important local impact. And to me, that's really, really important. Okay, my boss talk here. Get on. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite far from you, Hall. Oh, she's <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but anyway, anyway, like I said, impact factor are very high, but some of these things are really important. They have a lot of local significance for, for our local biodiversity conservation efforts. Okay. Um, so we, we do all this kind of research, it contributes to our baseline studies, contributes to biomonitoring, you know, and sometimes we focus on specific groups, like we have the expertise, we focus on those groups, right? Um, when there isn't, then we just Plot along until we find someone who is an expert, right? And this involves not just NUS, but NPAS, UB, NSS, the various um, you know, nature groups, the other institutes of higher learning, NTU, and all, all these other uh, colleagues. Okay, another way to move forward, right, if we worry about conserving our freshwater habitat, is to try to protect or restore or rehabilitate, right? One way, at least in terms of protection and to some extent restoration. And parks has been setting up buffer parks, for example, right? They designate buffer parks at the edges of the nature reserves. This gives places for people to come and uh, visit uh, and maybe take some of the pressure away from the core areas. Uh, and actually, one of our students was doing some uh, comparisons between the, the streams in the core areas, the buffer parks, and further out. And she found that besides protecting the core forest area, it actually helps to maintain freshwater communities and limit the urbanization impacts in the stream. Because these, these buffer parts, right, they look like forests. Some of the streams, they, they actually look like forest stream, you know, very nice, you know, the, the trees and all that. And the stream one looks like normal forest stream, but when you look inside, it got guppy. Because really it's on the guppy and non native, right? So it's on the edges. But still, it has some of those characteristics of a typical forest stream. So it helps the buffer. Um, another approach, and this one is more from PUB's perspective, uh, is to instill stewardship ownership over these freshwater habitats, right? Uh, this ABC Waters program, where they make these uh, freshwater habitats more accessible to to your public, right? People, right? In the old days, when I was younger, kid, whatever, uh, 
the, the way you protect our freshwater habitat, uh, our fresh waters, our PUVs, you cannot go full stop. No entry, right? Correct. No entry, you cannot go there. So you just go past one soon, right? The water looks so good, but cannot go in. Okay. So now what they do is they actually um you know uh, engage the public, they make these places a lot more available, accessible, uh, and, and multiple stakeholders can use them and, and all that. So you instill this stewardship and ownership and a better understanding for what you do might affect the waters in which you play in, right? Um, one famous example is the Kalang River Bishan Amokyo Park uh, project where they took a canal and they made it into a meandering, meandering, nice looking, naturalized looking stream if you were in England, right? Okay. Because it's an open area. But it's fine, it's fine, it's better than, it's better than a canal, right? Because if we really want to do restoration, means we bring back the old stuff, right? If we restore, means we kick everybody out from the flats, all that, we put trees. We put primary forest trees and all that, right? We can't do that, right? Simple, very small, we have to uh, compromise. So this one compromises. So this is not really restoration, but this is rehabilitation. So we have this desirable outcome. We like the place, but maybe not with not the original uh, fauna because you have non-native species there, right? But still okay, better than nothing. People still appreciate it. But what we found is that it's still dominated by non-native non -native cichlids. We did a study there. But the good thing is that it's still higher in terms of its native species that are there compared to a bit further downstream where uh, it's just a concrete canal. So not too bad. Um, so as we move forward, we're going to protect, we're going to restore, we're going to rehabilitate. The question about this thing about having introduced species in urban environments, do we act or do we not act? Right? Some people will say, hey, you invasion biologists, right? You shouldn't you be doing something about right? Get rid of it. Lah. Well, some people have asked me, hey, can you hey, you got electro fishing boat, right? You go and zap all the <laughs> all the, the non-native species for reservoir. I say for what? Firstly, by my boat, the range four meters only. Sorry. <laughs> the, the, the other thing is, when you zap, and you, let's say, let's say tomorrow I pull the tide and drain the reservoir, everything die. Right? Yeah. Then we fill the water. Okay, set. Right? The non-native, sorry, the native species, the forest, small little forest species, are not going to come out and say, hey, hey, you don't come out of the forest and swim in the reservoir. The, the habitat is different. Right? So there is a there's a place for them. All right. But still, you are concerned, right? Not when you worry, when you study biological events, you are concerned when non native species come in. So sometimes I get this, I get this from some of my colleagues. You lose biodiversity, you complain, right? Then I give you biodiversity, also you complain. <laughs> because, <laughs> because what happens is, you know, when you when you do rehabilitation, you're outside the forest, and right, the biodiversity it comes in is almost invariably going to be non native, right? You want, can do, make do. Uh. Right? But they're like, I still complain, uh, right? I mean, this, 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 is, uh, this is a coil, right? Come on. This one encapsulates it, uh, right? You go anywhere outside, right? You dig a hole, you put water. Tomorrow morning, there'll be a coil inside. <laughs> yeah, because everybody, <laughs> uncle, auntie, they walk, oh, so nice, I'm going to put a coil inside. Yeah. So every day, I walk past, I do my tai chi, you know, and then uh, you can see the coil. Okay? So there are these trade-offs, uh, right? Do we want to take Non-natives, do we want to be sort of xenophobic or anything non-native only we should know, right? So it's, it's a balance. Okay? It's good to know, um, and, but it's also more important to know whether and when to do something about it. Okay? Uh, then finally, when we focus on native species, or native freshwater species, we talk about conservation planning. We try to conserve big areas, but sometimes we focus on certain species in particular, right? This freshwater crab, this little brown freshwater crab, uh, it's called the Singapore freshwater crab. It's critically endangered. It's among the world's 100 most threatened species. It is on our National Park's board radar. Okay? They are worried about losing it. Usually people don't really care about crabs. Uh, they care about you know, more, more charismatic fauna. Right? This little brown thing, you can hardly see. But because it's called the Singapore crab, and because it, it, would, it was we got a lot of media attention and all that. This is something that uh, uh, I guess we'll, we'll try to do something about it, all right? So what we did was we tried to actually bring together multiple stakeholders, right? This was the first time we were doing this for any species in Singapore, let alone a crab, okay? Um, 
we focused on, and we got people from IUCN, which is the, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, together with multiple groups to come in and, and um, there was a lot of brainstorming and talking and coffee. Um, but ultimately, we came out with a threat analysis. We tried to identify what were the main threats, how we were able to address those threats, how we were not able to address those threats. That's also important, right? So, our, and ultimately, we came out with a strategy to, to move forward. Okay. Um, and we came up with further research uh, looking at, because uh, one of the gaps we found was that we, we know very little about the, the crab. We, we know it was described from Singapore. We know that it's lost from one or two places. And that's about it. We just wave our hands and say it's very bad, very bad. But we need to find out more. So we did some research after that. The National Passport um, kicked into high gear, trying to um, hatch them in captivity and translocate them and all that. And, stuff. and we even had a, um, a few projects, including the most recent one, the master's project by Alicia was hiding somewhere around here, probably under the, oh, there. Yeah, OK. Yeah, this is because you'll come for this. <laughs> OK, so Alicia's master's project, she was looking at, in particular, she was looking at these two particular uh, aspects of drought stress and pH changes, because these were two big question marks we found out at that, that, that big meeting. Um, because there are periodic droughts and all that, the crabs disappear, but then they come back again, right? So what's happening? Can they take drought? And somehow now, because of climate change, drought is going to happen more frequently or more severely or more unpredictably, right? Um, and also, one of the sites where the crabs were lost, right, is we found that the, the pH of the stream uh, had gone down. Mm. Like, I know they like acid water, but not that acidic, uh, very mm. acidic. Still, your finger won't dissolve, but still quite silly. Okay, so we were investigating that. Um, policy and management. So it's not all about research and all that. There's policy and management. There's no direct invasive species legislation in Singapore, um, but there are more general ones. And, and through these various, I think it's a bit outdated, some of this need to change, but through these acts, right, uh, uh, the, the government tries to, uh, tries to manage introductions and interestingly they, they, they do recognize the connectivity of fresh waters in in a, a few years ago they introduced this uh addition to this bill to, to say that you yes we know you cannot enter the nature reserve to release things but remember they're connected huh? so you cannot release things outside the nature reserve when you know that the drain is flowing in or flowing out and there's a chance that they may go in so uh watch out okay you cannot, you cannot go to the, the edge of the reserve and the, when the ranger wants to stop you, and no one outside. Right? Okay, and of course, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, volunteers and as well as uh, uh, government agents themselves from, from uh, National Parks and uh, Water Agency that try to educate, reach out to, to members of the public who like to release animals, especially uh, religious release happens a lot. Uh, or, or, or ethical release happens a lot uh, certain times of the year, right? And then speaking of education outreach, not just the, the ac academics, but everybody is trying to get messages out there. Information is power, la. okay? And sorry, shameless plug, the Concept and Natural History Museum also does education outreach, okay? <laughs> um, but yeah, so so um, some, of the, some of the work is also done by people from there together with our colleagues in these other areas. Um, I think that is all. So uh, thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, you think I drink? Yes. Um, wait, hang on. Because they're recording this, I think you have to use the mic. Okay. So, so my question is pretty simple. What's the prospect for the future? What does the next 10, 20, 30 years uh, take us in Singapore? Thanks for the question. Thanks for the very hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. 10, 20, 30 years into the future in Singapore. I think the first thing is to consolidate what we have. Um, so. Right now, um, the nature reserves are about as protected as can be. Um, uh, 
uh, the general public and the next generation, they're, they're getting more informed and, and uh, aware that we have. I have less of these questions about do we have fresh water and and all that. No? So people are getting more and more aware. There are some there are some people shouting in the wilderness and trying to explain to people that we have fresh water stream, we have fresh water biodiversity. So I think that is uh, one uh, important step. Um, there's also efforts to, uh, you know, even in areas outside the forest, right? So people are starting to appreciate um, uh, urban or sort of rural, rural streams that are not really the natural forest streams and all. So in areas that are significant for uh, conservation um, outside the nature reserves, there may be streams running through these and all that. Generally, these streams are mostly non native species, but people care about them too. Right? So I think uh, we're, we're heading in the right direction. Um, as long as we don't lose any more uh, habitat, I think we should be okay. Um, there will continue to be turnover in our reservoirs and all that. You know, what we have now, uh, maybe five, 10 years from now, I show you a different picture because there's turnover. Some of these species, they they will, you know, they'll be here for a few years, some of them will, will persist, some of them will just change. Right. Um, so I guess some of it might be might be at, um, might be based on patterns of, of import, export, what people are interested in at the time, and all that. Right. For years we had this thing called the Lohan. The Lohan was this uh, hybrid um cyclic, right? Uh, it was everywhere, people were buying them. Uh, keeping their flower horns, called flower horn, and then they were releasing them. And then it's a hybrid, right? So what happens is in the end, we have their parental stock appearing all over the place, right? So, but yeah, I, I think it's as good as it gets at the moment. I think it, uh, I guess as more people start to study some of these things, maybe it will improve even more. But there's a lot of, um, so, so in Singapore, there's always a lot of um, uh, multiple, uh, uh, uses right, so there's a lot of pressure on it, on everybody. One example is the the Kanji Kan Kalang River, um, the 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 rest the Kalang River at Bishan Rongkyo Park. That is a beautiful uh, example of rehabilitation, but it's very unlikely that they are going to be able to do more of that simply because there's no space, right? You got money, fine, but space is a space you can throw as much money as you yeah. want, so you cannot get a space. Right, so, so there are other other challenges. Yeah, sorry, I went on and on. <laughs> Good. Are we going to introduce the last species into Singapore if it is available as well? What? Sorry, what species? Uh, we we have lost some of the native species. Oh. Are we going to introduce? Okay, so the question is, we have lost some species. Are we going to reintroduce them uh, into Singapore? Um, this is a tricky question. They've done this for some species, mm -hmm. for for some birds and all that. Um, for freshwater, I don't know if they are planning to do it. They meaning the national park mm -hmm. board. If you ask me, I <laughs> I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't because right now we we know how the system is working. Um, because the system, uh, presumably. Everything that is there is occupying their certain niches, right? So if you throw it a new one in, you will have to think about what it's going to do to the system, to the other species in the system. So, so for example, the prawn that the deal was working on, right? Um, they wanted to, okay, it's a, a, a valuable prawn. They they uh, shrimp, but they wanted to try to um, translocate and start other populations in other streams that have suitable parameters. Mm -hmm. But one of the key things they were looking at also is, are there other shrimp that are similar to it there? Because we've got other native shrimp that we don't want to just take this and put it there because you might, mm. you might mess things up. Mm. Yeah, so, um, but, but whether you want to bring things from with genetic stock from elsewhere and all that, that becomes a bit of a philosophical question. Some people say no, some people say yes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, about my basic skill. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes. Just, I have a quick question, kind of related to to both Gandhi and David's question. Um, I'm wondering if the practice of introducing uh, fish as biological controls, if that's still something that's going on 
and or something that you think will continue to be part of, let's say, in parks practice? Um, I am not sure if anyone is officially introducing things for biological control. Uh, I, I think the giant snake head was introduced into some of the reservoirs in maybe 70s or 80s, I can't remember, uh, because there was there were a lot of lapyards there. You know, and and uh, every time there's some change in the conditions that you get fish kills and kind of thing. Um, other species like mosquito fish and guppies introduced to deal with uh, uh, mosquito breeding and all that. Um, I These species are already here. If they are effective, then taking them from one part of Singapore and putting them in another part of Singapore, where they are anyway, while you're hunting their numbers, I think doesn't make a difference. So bring in new ones, uh, mm -hmm. right? Or better still, try to identify native ones that can do the job. But again, native ones won't be able to do well outside the forest to begin with. Yeah, yeah I think that's what I was, I'm, I'm curious about because we now know, it, I'm curious about that because, you know, the history that you've sort of painted here is that as these new fish get introduced, there is a somewhat of an impact that they may have on, on other species. Um, knowing what we know, uh, you know, is that sort of a practice that wants to, that we might want to see moving forward and probably not, knowing that if we bring in a fish that's perhaps good to eat a plant, but has these other implications. I mean, there's the knowledge that we have now. Yeah, so thanks. So, um, yeah, as I said, 